Thank you very much. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. It's going downhill from now on for me uh, after these very nice words. Um, but hopefully it's not completely going downhill for all of you uh, as I am going to talk about fan fiction. The topic, of course, of this conference or this workshop is about balancing, balancing between copyright on the one hand and freedom of communication and freedom of expression on the other hand. And when we talk about fan fiction, it is tempting to look at fan fiction through that lens, to find a balance between those that want to have some control over their creations versus those that want to express themselves freely and communicate freely uh, about their views, their, their ideas, about how a particular piece of work or fiction could continue. I, with your permission, not like to do that. I'd not like to, in my presentation, talk about the balancing between freedom of expression or freedom of communication and copyright. Rather, I'd do something a little more focused on copyright, and that is I'd like to look at fan fiction just through the lens of copyright, just through the lens of uh, the attempts by legal institutions to exercise some modicum of regulation on creative works. And I'd like to start us off by giving you a little bit more uh, details about a story uh, that we already heard a little bit about just now, but which perhaps is worth uh, expanding a little more on. And that story has to do with a phenomenon that many of you are quite familiar with, namely the Harry Potter phenomenon. Harry Potter is not just a, a phenomenon in terms of book sales and movies. Um, so much in terms of merchandising has been produced from Harry Potter. There is an officially Harry Potter amusement park, and J.K. Rowling, the author, is the first author, it is said, that has... Uh, exceeded the $1 billion threshold of an author achieving uh, revenues. So J.K. Rawlings really has created an economic universe. And in this economic universe, her fans, hundreds of millions of people around the world, have actually helped her do that. And these fans have been active not just in buying her stuff, uh, but also in thinking about and living almost in the stories that she has created, perhaps pushing them further. What has helped them, among many other things, is a website, a website called the Harry Potter Lexicon. The Harry Potter Lexicon website is online or has been online since the year 2000. The... Uh, Founder of the Harry Potter lexicon, and the website is not particularly beautiful if you ever go there. It's really cluttered and all. But the, the founder of that Harry Potter lexicon website is a guy called Stephen van der Ark. And Stephen van der Ark is a, a school teacher. And he started the lexicon and he puts all of the characters, the figures, the plots, the subplots, uh, the things uh, and, and elements that play an important role in the tales on the lexicon. Uh, so that if you are getting lost in some of the complicated details of the saga, you can go to the lexicon and really find out who is with whom, when, and, and where. And the lexicon is quite heavily frequented. It's one of the most frequented websites regarding Harry Potter's tales. And J.K. Rowling's, in fact, gave the Lexicon website and Stephen van der Ark one of her most coveted awards, the Fan Award, in 2004, for providing a public service to her fan community. And she confessed that she uses the lexicon herself a lot in order to keep track of the intricacies of her tales so that she doesn't mix it up as she's writing whatever the end sequel is. Now, that changed. That changed dramatically in 2007 
when a rather obscure publishing company out of the United States approached Stephen van der Ark and said, Stephen, you know, you're a school teacher. You don't make so much money. Why don't we take all of the great content that you have written yourself about Harry Potter's universe and put it in a Harry Potter lexicon that's printed and we sell it? And Stephen van der Ark said, that's a great idea. Finally, I'm making some money and more than the stupid Google ads that I am putting on my website. And so they teamed up and announced their plans. And immediately, J.K. Rawlings intervened and sued Stephen van der Ark for potential infringement of copyright. She sued him, although she had given him the award for exactly, precisely the content that he now wants to publish in print form. That was in 2007 and 2008. And unsurprisingly, perhaps, Rowling's and her publisher won. That's not what I'm interested in. What I am interested in is not that they won. Of course they won. It's easy. It's a simple case of copyright infringement, right? They make some money, there is economic, uh, uh, economic damage, the judge had no problem going through the three-pronged test. That's easy. No, what I'm interested in is the argument that J.K. Rawlings put forward in the trial on why she wants to stop it. It wasn't, Van der Ark is making money. Her argument was, I feel intensely protective of the literary world I spent so long creating, and secondly, of the fans who bought my books in such large numbers. I want control. It isn't, Van der Ark is making money of me. That would have been easy. No, it's now, I am protective of my creations. I am protective of my creations. What am I protecting there? What is the creation that I am protecting? Well, let's look at and remind us of the tenets, the fundamentals of copyright law. See, copyright law, as we have heard over and over again, of course, is there to stimulate further creations by creating something like quasi-property. If we go to the United States Constitution, we find out that Copyright exists to promote the progress of science and useful arts. That is, copyright doesn't exist as a quasi-property right just for its own sake, but in order to promote progress of science and arts. That is, property is there with a purpose. It is a utilitarian concept of property, and you're all familiar with that. Now, when we look at this schematic here of the author doing a creation that then furthers and promotes arts and science and society and therefore stimulates, enhances, progresses society forward, we create a structure that is overly simplistic. And we know that. See, Nobody really thinks that there is an author that in his or her room creates something out of nothingness. We know that. But let's assume just for the moment that that's how it is. That there is a solitary author who has had no inspiration from anywhere and is creating a beautiful work of art. Let's assume that for a second then that is how the utilitarian copyright sees it. Now, when we compare that to the European or the Kantian author's rights, what we find is a slightly different setup where the author's rights exist as a natural right to honor the authors. And that's 
a different notion of it. There, the emphasis is not so much on property, but the emphasis is on connection and control. Now, when we look at J.K. Rowling's argument, what is so interesting is that J.K. Rowling's argument is made in a context of copyright law. We're talking about an American court case where copyright exists to stimulate further creations that is this property with a purpose. But J.K. Rowling's makes a connection and control argument. That is, she makes a continental European, perhaps Kantian argument in a utilitarian Lockean world. Now, I'm oversimplifying here between the Lockean world on the one hand side of the Atlantic and the Kantian world on the other hand, uh, on the other side of the Atlantic, and I know that there are moral rights in America and so forth, but the Americans never really have embraced moral rights are still living in a copyright world. And I'd say the real reason, of course, why they were angry is because the lexicon was up for sale at that moment. But, but that's not the argument that they were making. So they were creating an argument of connection and control, but this argument of connection and control was intention with, of course, the idea of property with a purpose. So there is a fundamental tension here if you use an author's rights argument in a copyright context, where, in fact, you could have made an economic benefit argument, but you chose a control argument. So there is the first tension that is present in this J.K. Rowling's approach. The second tension is even more interesting, perhaps. And that is, that is how she is approaching, and not only her, but many of the publishers and her colleagues in authors as well, how she is appro approaching authorship. The argument there is that they're idealizing authors as singular creators. I have created this universe. I need to be protective. Protective against whom? <gasps> protective against outside influences. Because I am the creator. And I owe it to my fans. It's a very interesting and intriguing argument. It gives her the kind of idealized version of a singular creator that has created what's there. But wait a minute. Isn't the fan fiction author then also the author who has created fan fiction? If that's true, then the fan fiction author, of course, deserves the same kind of protection, being the same kind of author creating protected work. Fan fiction authors, too, are singular creators. But wait a minute, if they are singular creators, how is it then that we can accept external influences namely J.K. Rowling's influence on the fan fiction author. If we accept that influence on the fan fiction author, that societal influence, then we weaken the view that there is a singular author. So we need to take away that. That's a stupid idea. Let's go back to the singular author. But if we go back to the singular author, why are we denying the fan fiction author a protection that we are extending in absoluto to J.K. Rowling's? There is a second tension, an unresolved tension around the myth of authorship. That is, of who the author is. Now, we have heard just before my talk about the contingency of authorship, the social and historical contingency of authorship. And of course, for all of us, that's almost obvious. Perhaps not for J.K. Rowling. What is authorship? 
as a lawyer, I would say, oh, authorship is what is being defined and what was understood to be the case when a particular law was drafted. A sort of originalistic or teleological interpretation, depending on what kind of philosophy you are following. So, if you're an originalist, you go back to 1789 and the American Constitution, and then we go back to the first Copyright Act at the beginning of the 19th century in the United States, and then you take out the idea of authorship. Is that the idea of authorship that we have? Is that kind of a singular author the one that we want? But if so, then that is, in the United States, authorship with a purpose. And perhaps immune, impenetrable to the view of a Kantian notion of connectedness and control. We can imbue and inject Kantian notions of connectedness and control into a Lockean concept of authorship, but then the authorship, of course, is contingent. That's okay, too. But if it's contingent in that manner, then it can be contingent in other manners, too. Why shouldn't it be? What is, therefore, authorship in the first place is a question that we need to ask, and we need to ask when we want to understand whether and to what extent fan fiction is permissible or not permissible. Not from, perhaps, a, uh, a legal standpoint, but from a more fundamental standpoint. Now, one way of approaching authorship, perhaps, is to look at this. That is to look at the quotation mark. It turns out that authorship, as a singular person who has control over something, in Europe is a relatively modern concept. And a concept that is somewhat in lockstep, not in total synchrony, but somewhat in lockstep with the changing use of the quotation mark. It turns out that centuries ago, 15th and 16th century, and the beginning of the 17th century, quotation marks were used to denote passages that weren't referring to a particular author, but that were passages that were so important that they were seen as common to all. So you put in quotation marks something that was common to all, not protected and not enclosed. Only in the 17th century you had the enclosure movement of quotes through the quotation mark. And that means at that moment it became controlled controlled by the author, supposedly. Now, if we look at authorship, therefore, through the lens of quotation mark, as something that is changing from a more communal viewpoint towards a more individualistic, controlling viewpoint, then we need to ask whether fan fiction where people feel tremendously connected to a community and therefore more communal ways of authorship is a strange aberration. An aberration that is so far away from what we have seen and understood from, uh, in, in authorship that we should completely disregard it. But is it really? See, I think that many of you, perhaps all of you, belong to a, communal, to a community of communal authorship of sorts as well, namely the academic community. An academic community where we act quite a bit like members of fan fiction, where we take ideas of others and develop them further, sometimes create tensions, sometimes disagree, sometimes move into another direction. The other side 
doesn't have copyright claims over it. The other side's only way of controlling is through the control of rhetoric, through the control of injecting and writing counter-articles, trying to push the discourse back in that direction. In many ways, what we do in academic publishing and academic authorship is we pay reference to authors that came before us by quoting them, by referencing them, and then by kind of reinterpreting what they said so that it fits our own narrative. Well, sometimes. So let's assume just for a moment that fan fiction is a little bit like academic authorship. If it is a little bit like academic authorship, then the fan fiction authors and the academic authors are different kinds of authors. And there's a different kind of authorship, more communal perhaps, where accepting each other's contribution is important, but, but not in the control sense, but in the sort of paying respect sense. But if we go down that route, then we begin thinking about different types of authorships. And of course, the copyright law does not recognize different kinds of authorship. There is only one kind of authorship for all. Therefore, if we begin to understand or begin to look closer at how fan fiction is not just a very small niche, but behaves like authors behave in other areas as well, what we are doing here is we are undoing the idea of a unitary authorship and we are undermining the myth of a unitary authorship. Now, where does this leave us? Well, with respect to fan fiction, the, the answer is relatively simple. Fan fiction exposes, of course, inherent tensions. No, that's nothing new. In fact, that's not unexpected either. Inherent tensions in particular about the rights holders' arguments. Had, for example, J.K. Rowling said, you know what, I don't want to earn a billion dollars, I also want the $10,572.25 that Mr. Van der Ark made. Then that would have been a relatively easy case. But she decided otherwise, and she is not the only one that decides otherwise. So she creates an argument that has inherent tensions. These tensions, though, are not new, but they take away her moral high ground. She doesn't live on that high ground anymore. That she has destroyed with her argument in the Van der Ark case. But for us, I think what is even more important and more pertinent is not how she and Rowling, uh, Rowlings and, and the publishers deal with this matter, but how fan fiction forces us to revisit important yeah, fundamental questions of what copyrights aims for and how it conceptualizes the social practice of creative work. Now, why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because my sense is that we will see and we are seeing more and more of these kind of control and connectedness arguments made by authors vis-a-vis -vis fan fiction uh, creators in the coming years. And we're already doing that. Now, with that, let me show you something here. I hope it'll work. This is a movie. Let's see whether it works. We are facing an enemy that is consumed and committed to our total destruction. But I say to you, our greatest challenge is not the might of a Klingon fleet. The greatest challenge laying before us is to do what must be done without undoing the dream of the Federation. The first goal was to create a class of ship that could spring Starfleet back into action, back into battle. It was the first pure warship that Starfleet had ever built. Well, that was Ramirez's first roll of the dice. 
they landed exactly the way we wanted them to, the way we needed them to. At that point, about the only thing we were doing that impressed the Klingons was dying well. Starfleet was never seen as a match for the Imperial Navy. Certainly not one that would impede the growth of the Empire. The bad blood between the humans and the Klingons meant that the job of preventing war and leading the peace delegations fell to Vulcan. Now, it's very easy for you to make that connection. That's a sequel of the Star Trek series, but it's fan fiction. I just showed you a piece of fan fiction, not a piece of the real movie. It's just so well done that it's really hard to differentiate it. It's not like Be Kind, Rewind, where people with tinfoil run around anymore. This is the real thing. And what I showed you was the product of a recent startup company crowdfunded called Axonar. And Axonar produces Star Trek fan fiction of professional grade. And they have announced and they have collected hundreds of thousands of dollars in start capital to produce a full feature fan fiction film of Star Trek. As you've seen, there are elements in it, the Klingons, the Federation, and so forth. But there is no Captain Kirk. There is no Spock. There is no pills in there. So it's a pure element of fiction, taking some of the cues of past Star Trek episodes and series. Now, Axanar uh, uh, was worried, though, about the economic dimension of that. If they make a lot of money, will the Star Trek rights owners go after them? So they decided to make this movie available for free and to just get the crowdfunding money to produce it, but make it available for free. No commercial gain whatsoever. With no commercial gain, what do you do if you are a rights holder? You can't make the economic argument. You can't, in fact, make a really good Lockean argument anymore. And therefore, what do you do? You do the J.K. Rowling's step. That is, you make a control argument. You shift to a Kantian control argument and say, no, Axonar, you can't produce this Star Trek movie, not because you make money of it, because they don't, but because you take stuff from us. Now, what stuff? Lines from text? No. What was so worrying to the rights holders in their complaint that just was made public earlier this week, I think, was the use, the likely use in Axonar's movie of the nerve pinch that Vulcans use in order to make people unconscious. Is there a copyright on the nerve pinch? And the other thing that they wanted to control was the Klingon language. Now, the Klingon language, of course, has the Klingon Language Institute online. That's a website. There is a whole a Duolingo language course on the Klingon language. They didn't object to that. Of course not. But of course, if the Klingon language is used in that particular fan fiction movie, it suddenly falls outside of the permissible uses, permissible in the purview, in the view of the rights holders. And when you read their complaint, what they want to control is the mood and theme of Star Trek as a science fiction action adventure. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when I took my first class in copyright in law school some 30 years ago, the first thing that I learned in my copyright class was that copyright does not protect an idea. 
It only protects the instantiation of an idea. And when somebody wants to protect and control the mood and theme as a science fiction action adventure, that to me smacks much like trying to protect an idea. Now, I understand completely why the fan fiction rights holder, why the rights holders start clang, uh, uh, clamping down on the fan fiction audiences and the fan fiction producers, on the fan fiction community. I completely understand. But I think that their arguments are not just revealing of weaknesses in their statements, but are revealing weaknesses in the very structures that we're using to protect. And as the Klingons say, which means, I don't understand. Thank you. <laughs>